In January 1943, Churchill and Roosevelt met at the Casablanca Conference and agreed policy on the strategic bombing campaign. In what became known as the Casablanca Directive, the 8th Air Force was given the responsibility to ensure the progressive destruction and dislocation of the German military, industrial and economic system. But flying unescorted in daylight hours posed a real threat to the bomber's crews. Flying at a mere 200 miles per hour, the B-17s were sitting ducks for the German Luftwaffe. At 30,000 feet, the crews of the unpressurized B-17s operated in extreme conditions. Encumbered by bulky clothing, engaging an enemy fighter was no easy task. It's 55 below zero up there, and uh, even though we had heaters, in the cockpit, the, the four gunners back in the rear, uh, they had no heat. And uh, even though they wore heated suits, some of them, uh, and wore a lot, of, uh, a lot of clothing, it was still very cold back there, and frostbite was a problem for them. The biggest thing people don't realize, people sweat at 45 degrees below zero. You sit there sweating. Maybe it was fair sweat, I don't know. It still is. Each crewed by 10 men, Thousands of them would fly the most perilous missions of the Second World War. Many would never return. By early 1942, in accordance with the Allied Europe First policy, Major General Karl Spatt suggested that the 8th Air Force be designated the core of the Army Air Forces in Britain. Now America prepared to send its new heavies to frontline units in England. Recognizing the value of bombing to the war in Europe, Britain's Prime Minister Winston Churchill and President Franklin Roosevelt agreed on the use of air power in the theater. Churchill and Roosevelt both unequivocally endorsed strategic bombing. In January 1943, they had called for the unconditional surrender of Germany and Japan, and they saw strategic bombing as the overwhelming force that would quickly end the war by destroying the German industrial complex and demoralizing its civilian population, they reasoned that they could grind to a halt Hitler's war machine. Early in 1942, Allied command identified special targets to be given absolute priority. Submarine construction facilities, aircraft factories, ball-bearing production plants, and oil refineries were at the top of the list. U.S. Army Air Force Bomber Crewman Flight Gear Flak Helmet, M3 Intermediate Flying Helmet, A11 Flying Goggles, B8 Oxygen Mask, A14 Flying Suit, AN6550 Electrically Heated Flying Jacket, F3A Intermediate Flying Jacket, B-15, May West Life Vest, B-4, Parachute, AN-6510, Armor Flying Vest, M-1, Electrically Heated Flying Trousers, F-3A, Flying Trousers, A-9, Bailout Oxygen Bottle, H-1, Electrically Heated Shoe Inserts, F-2, Flying boots, A6. For the crews of the B-17s, it was an opportunity to familiarize themselves with the aircraft and form bonds that would last a lifetime. There's 10 men in the, in the crew, uh, four officers, a pilot and a co-pilot, a navigator and a bombardier. They were officers. All the rest were enlisted men. Each man had his own battle station on the aircraft. The navigator and, and the bombardier were in the nose of the aircraft. And uh, you, you call through a hatch, and then you go up into the pilot's compartment. Here, the pilot, co-pilot, and flight engineer had their stations. Quite naturally, the pilot and co-pilot were real buddies, because they had to look at each other side by side, and they had to make sure that all of these buttons were punched, and all of this electric and all this hydraulics was functioning and everything. So they were very, very close. It needed to be. 
And then the engineer, when he wasn't manning his turret, would stand between the pilot and co-pilot and read off airspeed indicators and that kind of stuff. Behind the cockpit, in his own room, was the radio operator. He had a little space in there. It's kind of like a room, and he had all his radios and everything set up there. Further back, behind the radio operator, the ball turret gunner had a slightly smaller room, all of his own. Well, if, if you ever open a can of sardines, you know how it looks. It's all full. And the ball turret was that way. I wouldn't get in that ball turret if they gave me the airplane. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. The guys that got in there, I think, deserved a, a medal just for doing it. Behind the ball, in the largest compartment of the fortress, the two waste gunners kept up a constant vigil for enemy fighters. And then you had your tail gunner. That added up to your 10 people. I depend on you. You're the pilot. You depend on me because I'm a gunner. And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Each position has a responsibility to the other guys. It was a very close-knit little family. I mean, everybody had to do their job. Everybody depended upon the other guy to do his job. If somebody failed to do his job, something could go wrong. 